What's going on, everybody? This is going to be episode two of the Madden Insiders podcast. It's a podcast that me and Light started basically revolving around all things competitive Madden and currently mainly focusing on the Madden Ultimate League and just kind of the meta that's being shaped around that. So this is episode two. Episode one was posted on SoundCloud. The link to that will be in the description if you guys would like to check out episode one. And yeah, I hope you guys enjoy the podcast. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode two of the Madden Insiders podcast. I am Holden, joined here by Lights. How's it going, Lights? Hey, what's going on, man? Doing well, enjoying the the week two of the Madden Ultimate League. A lot of great games were played this week. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Eight games in total. Four on stream, four kind of off stream, a lot of switching back and forth. So a lot of storylines from the Legend Divisions. You got, obviously, Tweez kind of set the world on storm, or on fire, with the strong close offense that he came out with. Uh, He went 2-0, and then you have other guys who, you know, might have wanted their weekend to go a little bit better, but uh, can still definitely rebound. It's a long season, and so they have things to look forward to in the future. But starting off with that Tweez versus Chaos game, is there anything uh, that you kind of noticed? I know a lot of people were, you know, impressed with Tweez's strong close offense uh did you kind of have a take on that it was difficult to to fully see the scheme like you said a lot of cutting off between games and a lot of the times that we did see that game tweez was either scoring quick kind of like every time it went to the game it was off a highlight or he was on defense so i don't really know how truly effective the strong close is i know it is the uh stutter play is definitely different um, with the low ball and the effectiveness on that against a lot of the meta defenses is definitely really good. Um, I don't really know much about the scheme, though, besides the off tackle looking really good. Everyone that's running West Coast is definitely mixing it in to their offense, but Tweez is using it as a staple. Yeah, and that, that's kind of, I mean, you know, Tweez is my boy. Uh, I always like to see him be successful, but honestly, in this game, he went, ended up winning 21-15, but chaos probably should have won this game and probably outplayed him for the majority of the game uh chaos only threw one incompletion which happened to be a pick six and that was kind of what was his downfall was he kept getting you know into scoring position and then having to settle for three settle for three and then the one time he actually went for it on fourth down tweez makes a great play over the middle with i believe it was anthony barr and ends up taking it back to the house but kind of like you said tweez's offense looked very lethargic throughout that game really um, everybody was clamoring about the stutter goes play, which did seem to be effective against, you know, the Tampa two style defense. Kales was running a lot of four three normal Tampa two. Those stutters on the outsides look like they get a little glitchy when it gets to the middle of the field and inside of those cloud flats. The cloud flats don't really play them, and you can low ball it right as they start hesitating. And that seemed to be what was pretty effective for Tweez throughout this game. But even with that tactic, uh, his offense still wasn't fantastic. And, you know, he ended up kind of putting up the same performance in his next match against Drini. So it'll be interesting to see kind of how that offense evolves for him going forward, seeing as how it was his first time running that offense on stage. So obviously there are going to be some growing pains, but I'm very interested to see how he plays going forward out of that strong close. Yeah, he got the job done at the end of the day. He got the two wins. So he is 2-0, and and he's sitting at a really good spot to where even if he does wind up struggling with the offense, he does... You know, slip to let's say two and two, worse worse comes to worse, right? I mean, he's still in a really good position to move on. Anyone that's two and two has two wins. If you're looking at the standings right now, Dubby's two and one after losing a big game versus Problem that first week. Bounce back in the West Coast, getting the two wins. Yep. You have Problem with the two wins, two and zero. Oh. Joke, even though a lot of people are you know questioning his game. He's sitting at two and zero, and I think I think people are critical. We'll, we'll bounce back to, to each and every one of these players, but having those two wins is huge at this point. I think um, we briefly had this conversation off air not too long ago about how many wins you think you need out of those ten games to move on as far as the top six in the division. I think you probably could go four and six, five and five, and make it. Yeah. So for Tweez to be two and zero, and even though he's not really looking too sharp uh, on the offensive side more so than the defensive side. I think he should be okay with where he is. He just has to fine-tune 
how he's going to consistently move the ball. Because every time I watched him make a big play, again, it was off a big run with the off tackle, or it was off a playmaker to, let's say, Henry, or Henry breaking a tackle, um, a couple low balls. I know when he runs a stutter, he's he's looking for three low balls, essentially, which, you know, is risky because you, you could easily get baited into getting picked with that, with that method. So I don't know if strong close is good enough as an every down scheme as the main offense but he made it work to, to somehow win the two games whenever he needed to play he got it done and he, besides beating chaos he beat dreamy and that was another game where I, I kind of dreamy looked like you know he should have probably won that game it was a it was a high scoring game with a lot of running which is surprising that it was a high scoring game but uh what did you what, what was your take on dreamy this week and how he played he's one and two right now Drini, he's a very multiple player in the sense of he switches to a lot of different formations, runs a lot of different plays, but like we kind of talked about earlier uh, off the air, we talked about kind of top Madden being more run focused, it seems, their crew, you know, you got Problem, True Boy, Joel, Drini, they like to run the ball a lot, and, and Drini really was no difference in that matchup like we talked about with Tweez, where 23 carries that we were able to see on stream versus nine pass attempts, and he was a lot more effective on the ground and he was running a lot more 12 personnel so that you know one halfback two tight end two wide receiver personnel this game than he was you know in his opening week matchup where he did lose to joke and so you kind of saw that shift in scheme from him this week kind of took a step forward got the first win went one and one on the weekend put himself at one and two and he's definitely still in the mix to easily make it out I mean uh, everybody at this point is still in the mix. If you started 2-0 like you alluded to, you're in a really good spot to make it out. Like we said, might only have to win two more games throughout the next eight uh, to get out and make it to the playoffs. But for Drini, I think, I, if I had to predict, I think he'll he'll end up picking it up and making it out. I mean, he won the Madden Challenge this year, so you know he has it in him to kind of take that next step forward and, and further his game. So I expect him to, to definitely have strong showings going forward. Now, I did want to ask you a question. So I'm looking at the, the standings right now. You got Problem, Tweez, Joke at 2-0, and o, Dubby at 2-1. and one. We got True Boy at 1-2, and two, Drini at 1-2, and two, and then Musafa and Chaos both winless at 0-2 and 0-3 and and respectively. So out of the three undefeated, Problem, Tweez, and Joke all at 2-0, and o, who do you think stays undefeated the longest? Um, I think joke. I have to look at at the the current games. It's obviously, gonna, obviously gonna mad. I, wait, you know what? Wait, hold on. I think joke and problem might play next because I know that they were hinting mm. a a Echo Fox versus Luminosity that was coming real soon. So I don't know if that is gonna be next on stream when when this division comes into play, but it's gonna be the winner of that game because until Tweez can prove to me that he deserves to be to stay undefeated i think eventually he's going to slip and, and take an l um probably like we said going to be enough to move on dependent well again it all depends it's a long season i think seeing chaos at 0 and 3 and musaf at 0 and 2 you have to say right now those would be the two sitting out out of the eight six people make it so although Tweez might be fine i can't see him staying undefeated much longer so i think the winner of the joke problem game is going to be the one that stays undefeated. And I think the winner of that can stay undefeated for a while. I could see them grooving. Uh, Joke is not playing necessarily perfect on offense, but, you know, I didn't mention this in the first week of the podcast. Joke is a defensive player, right? Like, when people watch Problem, he's a defensive player, and people know he's a defensive player. So he doesn't look pretty on offense, even though he is making it work actually really well this year. He's very efficient. Um, Yeah, he is actually very efficient this year. Joke, on the other hand, makes a lot more mistakes than Problem, even though, you know, Joke might be a little bit more explosive, whereas Problem is a grind, will grind it out. Problem doesn't really make much mistakes. Joke is viable to make that pick six that he has been showing. I think defensively, though, Joke, you have to give him credit as one of the best defensive players. And that's why, even though he's making some mistakes, he's still winning these games. And I think that the way that Problem plays, I think Joke's going to edge that one out. And I think he can ride for undefeated to be undefeated a little bit longer. I know that he's guaranteed. I think he guaranteed to go ten and zero, which is not oh, going to happen. But bold yeah. statement. So, I think he has to, you know, like we mentioned, cut back on on the turnovers and 
the silly plays, the silly picks, trying to utilize some glitches that are out there in the in the community. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, he, he did have some uh, questionable reads in his first round matchup against Drini, but he, he did clean that up in week two uh, where he was able to go ahead and take down Chaos. We didn't get to see much of that game. It was off stream for the majority of the time, but he won 27-17. And, and Chaos is a guy, um, I just want to touch on him real quick. It's like I want to see him succeed because he does run that trips tight end, which is kind of a brush of fresh air, or fresh air uh, in the community in terms of, you know, it's not something that's seen too often. You know, other guys like Drag, I know uh, Manu runs it as well. And so it is somewhat represented, but he is the only player in this Ultimate League that does run that offense. So uh, always kind of root for the more unconventional players. Uh, to make some noise, so I'm hoping he turns it around soon. He actually looked pretty good in his game against Tweez, and he lost that heartbreaker in overtime, 21-15. You got to wonder if that kind of affected his mentality for the rest of the game, because he, he then had to turn around and play, uh, I think it was Drini, and then uh, Joke. It might have been in the reverse order. He might have played Joke first, and then Drini, and he lost both games, uh, 27-17 to Joke, and then 27-7 to to Drini. So, um Got to see how he kind of bounces back from that going forward. Uh, but, like I said, he has the potential. I think he, he did look good against Tweez. So, that'll be interesting to see going forward. Now, that off-stream game was True Boy Musafa. True Boy blew the doors off of Musafa, 34-7. to Unfortunately, we didn't get to see much of that game. And when they did kind of shift to it, it was already kind of out of hand. And so, we don't know much about that. Uh, but then Musafa then turned around and had to play Dubby once again off stream and lost 30 to 13. So it definitely seemed like a tough go for Musafa, who who runs that you know West Coast Gun Bunch uh, that the EMB runs and then the Nickel 335 uh, for the most part on defense. And so it'll be interesting to see kind of how he adjusts moving forward, seeing how Joke's having a lot of success. I know they lab a lot. Maybe Joke can kind of get in his ear and and give him some pointers and, and kind of help him going forward in the Ultimate League. Yeah, I think there's one key adjustment people are making against West Coast, and it is when they're in crossfire. Right? I spoke to Safa, and he said that, you know, he feels he feels confident still going into the, to the next few games, but those two games, you know, crossfire was, was giving him trouble, which you think crossfire, I mean, crossfire has been popular defense especially at 335 odd since, all year why is crossfire year. yeah yeah why is that giving him trouble well one thing that i've been noticing a lot of people doing with crossfire is sometimes just not even having the three wreck which the three wreck in my opinion is the best zone when they're okay so when you're when you're in bunch and you're seeing crossfire the main thing you want to do is you want to attack the sideline because if they only have one flat, you don't want to go near the three wreck because they're gonna, you know, that's gonna play underneath. Then the user plays the post or whatever in in West Coast. Yeah, you kind of want to go to the sideline and look for, you know, the C route, the corner route, the flats, things like that. Well, what people are doing now is they're putting their safeties or at least one of the safeties in a hard flat, and a 91 zone hard flat actually could pick off the corner route sometimes. So I think that that is a key adjustment people are making against the horizontal flooding of something like corner strike and that is you know what you typically want to go to against crossfire so if you could negate one side and then user the other side yourself as far as the sideline with a flat i think that that's giving west coast a little bit of trouble um little self plug i briefly broke that down on madden daily and um i feel good with with stopping with stopping bunch now and i see that a lot of pro players are doing the same so i think safa and whoever else is staying in that West Coast, you know, Dubby, Joke, Goes, is going to really have to figure out ways to successfully move the ball on that annoying crossfire, man. Because crossfire, the heat is coming. So you can't just have five routes out and easily dot it up. You know, you have to make quick reads to the sidelines or the middle of the field. And when they're blitzing and they're taking chance chances, putting safeties and flats and things like that, you can get stopped. So it's really about, you know, calling a, a cleaner game when facing it and I'm interested to see how the West Coast guys actually now you know transform their offense based off everyone knowing that that's the meta and finding ways to stop it so that's what I'm looking forward to most is seeing how the West Coast bunch is going to progress throughout this tournament yeah for sure I mean they're if they're having trouble moving the ball against crossfire they're definitely going to have to figure that one out because I mean off the top of my head, we know W runs crossfire 335 odd. We know Q 
Kiv runs it. We know Skimbo runs it. True Boy runs it. Tweez runs a lot of three, four odd crossfire. You see other guys who run dollar, maybe someone like Drini, he runs a decent amount of crossfire. So crossfire is almost in everybody's game plan, unless you, you run kind of exclusively something like nickel three, three, five. So it's definitely going to be something that you're going to have to find a way to be consistently successful against and kind of take advantage of the weaknesses that, you know, the crossfire t- setups usually present. And one of those ways is actually the draw. And you mm-hmm. put that something on Twitter about Dubby's draw yeah. in bunch, and he averaged 20 plus yards with the draw. And I don't really know um, the stats like you do as far as what defenses he ran against uh, when, when he ran the draw, but the draw does really well against crossfire. And a lot of the players are running it specifically versus crossfire, and that is because the looper, let's say he's on the right side looping to the left A gap, mm-hmm. leaving a huge vacancy to that right A gap. So when you run the draw, you go to that right side, there's a l- big possibility that you could break for a big gain, especially with a trucking back. You truck one defender, and you could be out. So that w- that's why W was having a lot of success with the draw, and I think that that is something that everyone when running West Coast should really focus on when facing the crossfire, depending on or no matter what defensive formation they're in running crossfire. Yeah, for sure. And I've talked about that on YouTube before on ways to attack that crossfire is the fact that that looping linebacker, no matter if it's a pass or a run, he's going to come looping across the formation. So if you run right at him earlier in the year, uh, guys were running a lot of, you know, gun bunch like HB base and stuff like that straight at that looping linebacker. And he would essentially he's, he's running himself out of the play. And so that's a very effective way to attack it on the ground right here. I got W versus True Boy. Two of W's touchdowns were halfback draws against Crossfire. It was a 52 yard hey. touchdown, yeah, and a 23 yard touchdown. He ran it. He ran the draw four times, housed it twice, and then the other two times he got four yards. But even then, you know, four yard gain is is not bad. It's it's you know depending on the down in situation, it can put you in a manageable you know short yardage situation that can open up your playbook. So definitely a lot of success with that halfback draw against Crossfire. I think that's a great point. I think a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people kind of get, especially out of that West Coast gun bunch, get pass happy. And so I think that's something that can get glossed over very easily when you're especially in the heat of the moment. And you can just kind of forget about how effective the draw can be in your game plan against someone who likes to run that crossfire style defense. Um, yeah, and I want I want to see a little bit more sweeps. I know that the, the, the base isn't in West Coast, but why aren't people running the sweep? At least try to, to establish the run against these type of defenses you know the, the the draw might not always work because i remember when kiv was playing skimbo he was destroying the draw but skimbo was also making it kind of obvious when he was running it he was doing the motion with the tight end mm-hmm. and and kiv was in crossfire stopping it but kiv was also blitzing a lot of people um so you could you can stop the draw in crossfire but that probably means the outside is going to be an easy you know you're going to be able to break outside you know, easily against the crossfire if they're really heavily blitzing the middle and not respecting that. So I don't see the sweep barely ever uh, with West Coast users in bunch, and I don't. I really don't know why. Yeah, I don't know why they're not mixing that in. I don't think I've seen it yet, and and that's a good point. I think I think a lot of people kind of write off the sweep as kind of like a, a bad run. I think it kind of has that stigma just because it's kind of weird how it's a like a pure horizontal handoff, and it has the potential to get blown up in the backfield. So I don't know if it just kind of the inconsistency of it is too big of a drawback for people to turn to it i know earlier in the year before people were kind of on the west coast and more people ran stuff like tampa bay um tampa bay doesn't have the base either and that's that's their run packages you have the draw and then you have the sweep so you kind of saw it more from you know the tampa bay users and then those guys moved over to west coast and kind of i think the the sweep just got phased out because i think in tampa bay i could be wrong but i'm pretty sure the sweep is the run audible and so and that was before you could set the audibles before they had the audibles on the fly. So people right. were kind of cornered into using the sweep um, as their run option if they didn't want to come out in the draw, in which that would severely limit their passing option. So it was kind of more of a de facto, you know, this is what I got, this is what I have to go with type of deal. But that is a good point. I, I think you could definitely have success with those defenders looping towards the interior of the defense and you, you get to, to the sideline where there's, you know, less help. Um, I, I think you could definitely have some success with a play like that. Now, moving on um, to some of those later matches, uh, we touched on W Mus- Musafa 30-13 W victory there 
Uh, Tweez edged out the game against Drini 34-30. to Didn't get to see much of that, uh, but Tweez was having a lot of success on the ground. 10.4 yards per carry with the halfback off tackle from Strong Close. So that's something that Drini might need to, to kind of touch up on if he has to play Tweez again in the future, which I believe they do because I'm pretty sure they're in the same division. And then we come to problem versus True Boy. And I know True Boy was someone that you kind of wanted to touch on with that single back wing flex offense out of the Eagles playbook. Uh, he had a really good showing off stream against Musafa and then his two on stream games. He, he he didn't come out with the victory. He lost a problem 19-13 and then lost to Dubby 23-13. Yeah, so both of those losses were good games. He could have won both. Uh, you know, both really came down to the end, I would say. Dubby's game was a little bit more. Dubby was, you know, controlled. But I think that True Boy, I really like the single back wing flex. It's something that I'm really looking into to run as, you know, almost an every down offense. And I love it. I love the passing. I love the running out of it. I love the motion that they do, motioning the slot to the tight end side, mm-hmm. establishing the stretch with you know three guys in that area, easy to spin or cut back or utilize a trucking back to have success. I love the 0-1 trap that, that they have. The, the run game out of that set is really good. Um, I think the passing out of that set is better than a lot of the passing that i seen True Boy using from other sets. I think True Boy, in the games that I was watching – mainly against well actually in both he, Drew Boy kind of ran his offense a little differently against Dubby and against Problem for his Problem he was you know using a lot more formations other than the wing flex when he was running the wing flex I think you alluded to it that he was running the stretch a lot but not necessarily the passing out of it Yeah. whereas versus Dubby he wasn't running as much he was passing but I don't know like I feel like he called two completely different games against Dubby and against Problem and we didn't get to see the Safa game, but whatever he did against Safa clearly worked. So I want to know what he did against Safa. <laughs> and not only do I want to use it in my scheme, I want him to use that going forward because I feel like versus Problem, he ventured into too many formations. Versus Dubby, he passed a little too much. Like Dubby, Dubby even said it at the end. He was like, you know, True Boy's a runner. Once I got him to start passing, he got, I think he said he got too cute. And, you know, he, he felt good to to stop true boys passing true boys a runner stay true to your game you know make them to make them stop that run and then establish the the passing but um, i think true boy you know game by game he's gonna have a little bit of of, of a scheme difference and i really want to see one or two more games before i could decide like what he really wants to do out of that eagles book yeah it was it was very interesting looking at the different schemes he kind of approached with uh, out of that single back wing flex based on when he played problem and then when he played dubby like you alluded to against problem he went with 16 carries and 10 passing attempts and against dubby he went with five carries and 13 passing attempts now this is only what we could see on stream uh, but still that's a that's a pretty large shift in terms of uh you know rushing attempts passing attempts and so he definitely seemed to favor a more conservative game plan against problem and so i don't know if that's because of the kind of player that problem happens to be and that he, he kind of knows what kind of game problem wants to play and it's more risk adverse. He doesn't want to try and open it up because he knows if he turns the ball over, you know, one time against a player like problem, uh, you know, problems just going to put him in a stranglehold basically and, and just, you know, take the life out of him slowly, but surely as the game, be, as the game wears on, you know, just beat him down with experience. Basically that's the kind of game problem loves to play. So, I think it will be interesting seeing kind of how he branches off out of that single back wing flex going forward. I think, like you said, it has a lot of potential, and I think that was shown. I mean, he had a pretty productive day, um, not only in, obviously, the Musafa game, but also against Problem and Dubby. He, he wasn't inefficient on offense. He took care of the ball for the most part. And so I, I think one thing I did want to touch on, he had a fantastic 0-1 trap play call against Problem where he housed it for 43-yard touchdown. And it was, it was set up beautifully. It was like the first time all game that Problem shifted his D-line. And it put the nose tackle in a perfect spot to get trap blocked. And it was the first time True Boy had run the 0-1 trap, I think, at the tournament. Because I don't have it unless he ran it against Safa, which is definitely a possibility. But that was the first time he ran it in that game against Problem. And you could tell Problem was not expecting it. And uh, True Boy went like right up the middle for a 43-yard touchdown. So that might have been the best play call 
that I saw all weekend. I was, uh, you know, super impressed by that. But yeah, I'm excited to see how he does going forward for sure. So, quick question: True Boy or Drini? They're both one and two. Who do you feel more comfortable moving on? Hmm. Yeah, man, that's it. If I was going off of just the games from this past weekend, I would probably lean towards True Boy. Yeah, me too. But it's tough because in the back of my mind, I know Drini won the Madden Challenge. He's had a good year. Um, I, I, it's hard for me to say Drini won't move on. I think they'll probably both end up moving on. But if I had to say one more likely than the other, I'd probably lean towards True Boy right now. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, you know, we're we're putting a lot of criticism on True Boy's game right now. But he, like you said, he looked good. He, he just, he, he looked did. different. He looked different in those two games. And I just, I want to see what his, if that, like, if that's how he is, if he just, like, because he is kind of more of a freestyle type player. He likes to play different. And, and I think he, he plays based off the feel of the game. So going and seeing more of his games, it's going to give a, an indication of how he wants to play. And I just think Drini, I think both of them truly probably make it out. It's, 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 again, it's hard at this point because there are 10 games. Uh, if you had to guess, you know, Chaos 0-3, even though he hasn't play, been playing bad, you have to say he right now would be the favorite to not make it out. Whereas, same thing with Safa being 0-2. But, um, yeah, for one, being 1-2, one I would not feel too worried if I'm True Boy. More so than Drini because... Drini lost to Tweez in a game where Tweez did not look good. Yeah. So if you are going to be someone that could win this thing, you can't lose that game. Like Tweez won that game based off the fact that he's naturally usually really good at this game. Like even though he didn't look clean, he just found a way to win. Whereas like Drini just got to win. He has to win that game. That was a hard game to to lose because he's going to have to play Joke again. He's going to have to play Dubby, True Boy, and Problem still. So a lot of tough games to, to go in that division for him. I think, you know, he probably will still make it out. But, you know, initially in week one of this, we were saying that he might be the top. And now it's looking like, I would have to say, Joke is the is looking and going to be at the top of that division where, you know, you can't count out Tweez being 2-0. and But right now I would say Joke is probably the best in that division currently going on to week three. Yeah, I would actually agree with that. Um, now looking forward to kind of this weekend's matchups. So you got the Elite Division B with Kiv, Skimbo, Stevie, and Spot Me, and then Elite Division A with Joel, Blocky, Prodigy, and Ghost. Now we've seen Ghost and Joel the whole showdown week one, uh, where Joel was able to beat Ghost straight uh, off the back of that Madden Club Championship that Ghost won, and then we were also able to see Skimbo play Kiv, where Kiv won a game. Uh, that went down to the wire. He got a pick, you know, basically on the last drive of the game that sealed the deal for him. I think he won that game 20 to 17. So we've seen those four guys in action, but out of the four guys we haven't seen yet, Stevie, Spot Me, Prodigy, and Blocky, who are you most excited to see play this weekend? I am going to say probably Spot Me because <laughs> I don't know. Like, I know what Stevie's going to bring. Because I, because I talk to him a lot, and I, you know, I'm always talking to EMB guys. I'm in their chat. Like, I know what Stevie's gonna bring to the table. So I think it's kind of almost biased to talk about his game plan right now until he plays. But um, spot me. I, I don't know. I know he's gonna run what he always runs with the bunch tight end, the bunch in Seattle. He runs a little empty bunch, but he does mix and match where where he goes and spots and in the red zone he runs a little QB draw. I know his game, but at the same time, you know, you can never count out Spot Me versus any one of these guys. Spot Me Skimbo is going to be a hell game. Spot Me Kiv, hell game. Spot Me Stevie J, hell game. Even, you know, looking at the other division, going with Goz, Joel, Prodigy, Blocky. I'm looking to see how dominant Spot Me is going to be. I don't think he's going to be dominant, but I think he's definitely going to be in the pact of being one of the tops of this whole elite division. Yeah. I could definitely see that being the case. Obviously, the pedigree's there. The past success is there. And it is always nice uh, to watch him run Gun Bunch tight end. Uh, he's really kind of known for that formation. And uh, definitely seems to always have just really good dots out of it year in and year out, no matter how the game changes. So I'll say I'm excited for that. Um, 
the, if I had to pick somebody, I'd probably say it might not be the most exciting pick, but I want to see Blocky play. And the reason is, although he does run West Coast and nickel 335 last time we saw him, um, he was just very dominant in the Miami Dolphins Club Series. And now he might not have faced the best competition, but he looked really, really good. And then he fell to Skimbo in the second round of the club championship. But that was a game, if you remember, Skimbo said basically he had never prepared for a player as much as he prepared for Blocky. And that was kind of the inauguration of the whole, you know, come out and pistol, fake hike, the aggressive pass rusher on 335, and then audible to bunch. And that was the first time really anybody had ever seen that. And Skimbo really started a wave in terms of how people attack. Uh, that nickel three through five Tampa two out of you know if you're running the West Coast playbook or even any other playbook that has like a pistol formation, so I think it'll be very interesting. It definitely seemed like Skimbo's preparation won him that game, but going forward, Blocky against you know kind of well Ghost is kind of like a mirror of him. They both run West Coast three through five. Joel is a wild card in this group, and so is Prodigy. So I think. It'll be interesting to see kind of how he comes out and performs because we know he, he has the ability to have an incredibly high ceiling. And so I'm pretty excited to, to watch him play in the Ultimate League. I would say this. You have Joel, Prodigy, Stevie J, and Spot Me. Four out of the eight don't run West Coast. Everyone else does. And actually, Prodigy might run West Coast. I think I think he might. Okay, so <laughs> what I'm getting at now is who is going to stop West Coast the best out of Stevie, Spot Me, and Joel? And oh. Joel showed that he could stop it yeah, versus Ghost. That's... And I don't know mm-hmm. I don't know if it was, again, mental with, with the whole Ghost situation and heavy rivalry. Can he do this consistently? I like that he mixed up his plays in the dollar. He didn't stand crossfire. He really you know, used assortment of different coverages which is a good way to stop West Coast. But I think, you know, not everyone could get in. And looking at the bottom lineup and then looking at Goes and Joel, I don't know who's the two that are not going to get out. And it's going to be who can't stop West Coast. If you can't stop West Coast, you're not getting out of this division, out of this elite conference. Because there's too many people running it. And if you are great against West Coast, you're gonna, you might get the bye. Like everyone's counting out Stevie J. If he has great West Coast defense... He can be in first place. Not a lot of people are going to expect that, but you could stop Skimbo, you could stop Kiv, and you could stop Goes, and you could stop Blocky and Prodigy. Everyone runs the same thing. So if you have the D for it, this is the divi- this is the conference to be in. Stevie labs with the EMB guys, right? Like Ghost joking them. Oh yeah, no, he he's ready for, yeah. for West Coast. So basically, his entire crew runs West Coast. He's like the only one in the crew that doesn't. So if if I had to pick anybody, although. It's hard to not pick Joel because we've seen him have the defense for it. But I would think Stevie will definitely have the defense for West Coast, being that, you know, his group is basically filled up of the best West Coast runners on the planet. Um, I mean, you could certainly make a case for Joke and Ghost being, you know, holding that title. Obviously, Skimbo runs it very well as well, among others. But, yeah, I think Stevie will definitely come prepared. Now, spot me. Last time I watched him, I believe he was running a lot of dollar, so it'll be interesting to see kind of how he approaches slowing down the West Coast, but I think Joel and Stevie will, will definitely both be ready to, to stop West Coast Gun Bunch for sure. Spot Me runs a lot of man blitzes, so I'm interested to see how he works West Coast with that, and Stevie, I know he Stevie is a runner and a defensive player. Passing the ball is where it's going to come down to for him. And Spot Me runs a lot of man coverage in the dollar. So he's he's sending a lot of heavy blitzes. So he could either get some big stops or he could give up big plays. And that's kind of his style. He runs a lot of cover two notoriously every year mixed in with the man blitzing. So I would say with Stevie, I think it's really going to come down to his offensive passing game. Because we know he's one of the best runners. He's really good as far as usering with, um, with Barr, I believe he had in the club championship so the defensive side i know stevie's gonna get a stop so i think it's gonna come down to the offensive side for him prodigy and blocky i just especially prodigy i just don't really know much about him and what he's gonna bring to the table but i think he definitely better have west coast d if he's gonna move on and if he does he can it's it's gonna be difficult i would say 
I can't tell you. I can't tell you who the two underdogs are in this in this group. Yeah, I guess tough. you would have to say Stevie and Prodigy. It's really tough, and and that's like I mean, it's hard to pick Stevie and Prodigy as underdogs. Whenever, I mean, Stevie's looked good throughout the year, um, and even Prodigy got the first round by in the Madden Challenge. Although he he ran into a red hot Drini in the semis and got knocked out, but he he went undefeated in his group three and zero, and then. I think he made a super deep run in one of the Vegas challengers. And so I, I think Stevie actually talked about it last week where he basically didn't know who Prodigy was. And then after he played him, he was like, well, I, I know who he is from now on because dude is really, really good. So yeah. it, it's tough to just like say he's an underdog, especially because he's looked good in the tournaments he's been in this year. But with such tough competition. I would just say... Exactly, just based off politics, right? Yeah. Just based off the names. No, I how I else agree. how else do you say not them? And that's no disrespect to Stevie. I think Stevie's gonna move on, but I don't know who else I could say besides him that's not. I can't say Skimbo or Kiv are not gonna make it. Yeah, you know. No, I, I especially agree. With, but so it, between guys like you know Skimbo, Kiv, um, and then and the other one, the two names, obviously Joel and Ghost jump out. I mean, it's hard to bet against any of those four. And so that leaves us, you know, with the four we were talking about, Blocky, Prodigy, Spot, Me, and Stevie. And even just out of those four, it's it's, it's really tough trying to predict kind of how things are going to shake out, especially not seeing those four guys play yet. So I think it'll be a very exciting weekend for competitive Madden. I think we can we can definitely say that for sure. Yeah, I think we'll have a lot to talk about for week three. That's for sure. Yeah.